This is the Monday, February 20th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and happy President's Day. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, we're going to put some serious years and miles on the old DeLorean. Starting in the mid-1700s, Tidewater region of Virginia, and ending over 200 years later, across the ocean in Hawaii. In between, we'll make a bunch of stops in Ohio, and cast an eye towards President Donald Trump's birthplace in our greater New York City borough of Queens. Playing Doc Brown to my Marty McFly on this time travel adventure is Louis Picone, author of Where the Presidents Were Born, The History and Preservation of the Presidential Birthplaces. From George Washington to Barack Obama, the book shares insights and history of the homes, highways, and hospitals of the first 43 men who've served as our Commander-in-Chief. And no, it's not 44. Don't forget the historical asymmetry of New Jersey's own Grover Cleveland. One man, two presidents. Since there is no escaping the circle of life, even if the Marine Band does play Hail to the Chief every time you walk in a room, Lewis is also the author of The President is Dead, the extraordinary stories of the presidential deaths final days, burials, and beyond, which we'll be discussing in a future episode. If you love walking in the baby steps of our presidents, and who doesn't, you'll want to check Lewis out at facebook.com slash presidential birthplaces, and check him out at lewispacone.com, where Lewis actively shares his enthusiasm for the men who've served in America's highest office. Louis Bacone and I are both from the Garden State of New Jersey, just like Grover Cleveland. So we decided to meet up at one of the hidden presidential jewels of the Jersey Shore. It's the Church of the Presidents in Long Branch, where seven commanders-in-chief vacationed in Gilded Age splendor. You can check out the site, now home to the Long Branch Historical Museum Association, at churchofthepresidents.org. And if you like these presidents, most of them from the Gilded Age, talking about starting with Grant roughly through Wilson with a couple of dropouts, why not plan on checking out their cocktail reception this August? You can find information on that at churchofthepresidents.org, and I promise you it'll be an event unlike any other and just a great fundraiser for a really one-of-a-kind historical site. Okay. Now that we know a little bit about Louis Picon's passion and the place we'll be meeting up, let's catch Louis and visit where the presidents were born. I'm here in Long Branch, New Jersey to visit the Church of the Seven Presidents with Louis Picon, author of Where the Presidents Were Born. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for having me. First, it's always great to sit and talk with somebody who loves presidents as much as I do, so this is going to be very entertaining. I saw your car outside, and you have a (laughs) – I figured that must be yours because it had a Garfield Arthur 1880 sticker on it. So custom-made one. (laughs) (laughs) You're you're very into this kind of thing. And we're uploading this on President's Day so people can enjoy the episode as they watch a lot of these things that sort of remember some of our relatively unknown presidents like Garfield and Arthur, along with the greats 
place like Washington and Lincoln and all the ones that we know right away, people even that aren't as into presidents as we are, for listeners who may look at this as just another three-day weekend for the ski lobby, explain to us how this date came to be and what the holiday means to you as somebody who does love the presidents. Well, for me, I think every day is President's Day. Uh, but I love President's Day because it becomes everyone else gets to talk about the presidents and gets to learn so much about the presidents. So the day actually started out to celebrate Washington's birthday. It started in 1879. That's when it became a federal holiday. Over the years, it morphed into also celebrating Lincoln's birthday. So it turned into President's Day, but it's actually still officially Washington's birthday on the federal calendar. So I like to also think that we're celebrating Reagan's birthday and William Henry Harrison, which is also in February. But it's a day just to think about all of the presidents because everyone contributed something and everyone did something to shape our country now. I always try to do that when I read the biographies. I say to people, I find something to like about every one of them. People like to ask us to make things by category. Who's your favorite? Who's the best? But if you read these things and you read them all as being our presidents, you find something likable. And granted, some of them do challenge you to find something likable. You know, John Tyler, you might have to dig pretty deep to find something likable about him. But you can if you look, even if it's something like a little joke, like his thing of running for sheriff, you know, in, in his town. So he could kind of stick it to the neighbors that were giving him a hard time about yeah. his presidency. So they all really do have something in them to like. And it's great that we have a holiday that's history and there's history behind every holiday. But it's great that this one has so much of it. Yeah, that's what I find myself too. After researching and reading about the presidents for so long, I've got a big bookshelf with books about all of the presidents. You do tend to like them, to find something likable about all of them, and respect the office and respect the enormity of the decisions that they make. So, yeah, you really do come to find something about each one of them that you like. Now, I mentioned your car, and you and I both know history lovers who will pick up those stickers like I visited mm -hmm. Reagan's birthplace, you drove up whatever mountain. The final resting places are also marked. But for listeners who are hearing about this kind of well-worn path for the first time, tell us how you decided to start on this trek that became where the presidents were born. Well, it started out just from the love of history. Years ago, I used to like to travel around to different national park sites, to different historical sites. So I like, I've got a little story in the book that years ago, I kind of ran out of gifts for my parents. So I decided to take them on road trips. So we'd pack up the minivan and we'd bring my kids and bring my parents and we'd drive around to different sites. So one of the trips we took was out to Louisville, Kentucky, where we actually went to go see a festival about the Beatles, because I'm a big Beatles fan. So driving out from New Jersey out to Louisville, Kentucky, I looked on the map and we were driving through Ohio. And just from looking at the map, I noticed that there were seven presidents born in Ohio. So I thought that would be interesting to try to zigzag and get to see all of their birthplaces. So that's what we did. I found they were all very different and unique sites. And then after the Louisville, uh, after going to the Beatles Festival, then we also went to Abraham Lincoln's birthplace. So just seeing those eight different birthplaces, the variety that there was, some were just roadside signs like Benjamin Harrison, other were these grand monuments like Lincoln's birthplace. And some of them were a little difficult to find any information about. And the one that sticks out in my mind was Warren G. Harding. I couldn't really even find, even from looking on the internet, exactly where he was born. I knew the town he was born. So from that, that kind of got me into researching the birthplaces, trying to find books about him or trying to find information. That's where I couldn't find any other books about him. And that's kind of what kind of inspired me or like the light bulb went off that this would make a great book. And it's not a thick book, not a textbook. It leans more towards the coffee table variety and also functional. So lots of vivid pictures, but also these tables with key facts, something you can put in the back of your car if you go on one of those road trips to Ohio. So when you wrote where the presidents were born, what was that reader you were picturing finding when they picked it up? Well, it started out as a book that was going to be about traveling to the birthplaces. Uh, so I, so I mentioned I, uh, I would travel to these birthplaces with my family, uh, with my parents, with my wife, my boys, my nieces. We'd we'd load up the minivan and go driving around. So it started out to be almost like a visitor's guide. Uh, so I've got the checklist in the back where people can check off the birthplaces they've been to. I've got directions in there. Uh, I've got. Uh, uh, information, so visitors' information, uh, other things that you might want to do while you're in the area. Uh, but as I, uh, I researched and I found 
every birthplace has their own individual and unique and often quirky and funny history. Uh, so uh, I realized as I got into the writing, that's the book that really needed to be written, or that's the book that I wanted to write, was the history of every birthplace. Uh, so I think that's where the format came from, because I, w I still wanted it to be that visitor's guide. Uh, so maybe if you're if you're traveling to Herbert Hoover's birthplace, you don't need to read the whole book. You can just read about Herbert Hoover, uh, and it'll give you great information on the history of the site. Uh, but also, there's rich history of the uh, of the birthplaces and the preservation efforts too, and that's where things sometimes really get interesting. Because uh, the thing about birthplaces that struck me as so interesting is that there's so many historical sites where uh, uh, something historical happened and people know right away that that site is historical, like uh, Gettysburg or, or Independence Hall. But birthplaces, they're not considered historical until 50, 60 years later. Yeah, you say in the rearview mirror, that's when people know they're historic. Yeah. And speaking of visiting the birthplaces and us being here in New Jersey at a historic site, we only have a single presidential birthplace. That's the Grover Cleveland birthplace in Caldwell. The closest to us after that, I guess, is number 26, Theodore Roosevelt's in Manhattan, and now number 45, Donald J. Trump in Queens, which is still a functioning hospital. You do a trip to Ohio. As you said, you can rack up a lot of presidents there. You can rack up a lot if you go to Virginia. But I wonder how you did deal with some of those far-flung, ill-defined sites like number five, James Monroe, which is a Virginian. But some of those, you have to go really far, and you talked about taking your family there. So how did you go see Seek out those, especially when you might know there's not much there to see. Like, for instance, one one of our modern presidents that's in a hospital, Jimmy Carter, was the first president born in a hospital. So you have to haul your way down to Georgia and go to see a hospital, which is not a historic site. Maybe not anybody there with any history. They might not even know the room. Maybe they do. You'll tell me. But so how do you get motivated to go to those places? And more importantly, for the purposes of where the presidents were born, how do you bring that to life for your readers? Well, for the motivation for me, I mean, I don't need to generate any other motivation by beyond just wanting to see these sites. So to me, they're really interesting. And some of the most interesting stories and the most interesting sites are at these far-flung sites, like Chester Arthur's birthplace in very northern Vermont, very close to the Canadian border. So those are the ones that, because there's maybe so little attention on those sites, to me, some of them have the most interesting histories. So Chester Arthur, they built a home there in the 50s that was billed as his birthplace, a replica of his birthplace. Years later, they found out that that wasn't his birthday, so they just changed it to the Chester Arthur historic site. As far as motivating my family or motivating people to come with me, luckily, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, they say. So I have family members that enjoy these things, too. One of the examples I like to say is that years ago, I wanted to go visit Millard Fillmore's birthplace, which is in northern New York. It's about a 10-hour round trip from where I live. I called up my father. If he wanted to come, didn't even hesitate. Yes, I want to come with you. So we drove up to the site, 10-hour round trip, and basically it's just a sign, and there is a recreated cabin there too. But again, just because there's such interesting sites and the histories of them are so interesting, I think that'll help motivate people to kind of go out of the way on maybe on other trips. If you're driving down to Florida, this is what we did for Jimmy Carter's driving down to Florida. We took a detour through Plains, Georgia. Well, and I wouldn't sell short your passion either, because for any writer, if you're writing things and you're writing them vividly and interesting, you'll be able to make people want to go. When we were driving from Canada, my wife came in on her fiance visa and we had to drive all her stuff back to New Jersey. So that's a lot of, that's Wisconsin, that's Minnesota, that's the Dakotas driving through. And we got to Ohio and I said, oh, look at the sign here. Just because as soon as you hit the border coming that way on I-80, you see the sign for the Ruth Ruby Hayes, Spiegel not his birthplace, Grove. but yeah, Spiegel Grove, his home. And I said to her, well, how would you like to pop in there? Meanwhile, we're dragging a U-Haul and we just kind of want to get back. She wants to get to where she's moving, but she was very game for it. And this was her first presidential museum. She's Canadian, so she doesn't <laughs> she hasn't gone to one. They, they don't do these kind of things for their prime ministers. So we went in there and 
I like to feel that because I was passionate about it, I brought that to her. And eventually when we did get married, we did tables. We named them after presidents. It was kind of a trend starting at the time rather than just numbering. You would number them after an island or a sports team or something like that. And so that's what we did. We named them after tables and made the head table, the Rutherford B. Hayes and <laughs> Lucy Hayes table. But it was something where – she loved the house. It's this beautiful Victorian house. And it's a compelling way to learn history rather than just reading a book. I don't see my wife sitting down and reading a biography of Rutherford B. Hayes, but you can go to their houses and see people like yourself that have passion about them. And I think that that's where the presidents were born brings you. And speaking of Rutherford B. Hayes, his birthplace today is kind of a standalone site, not what you would expect. So Tell people about it. Hayes was our 19th president. What will history spelunkers find when they visit there now? Yeah, people sometimes ask me what my favorite birthplace is, and it's definitely Rutherford B. Hayes. And going back to some of like these sites that are a little bit off the beaten path, I think that's one of the great things about the birthplaces, because they're not set in the middle of a city. They're not tourist attractions. They weren't meant to be. So they take you off the beaten path, too, and you get to see beautiful things along the way. One of those sites is Rutherford B. Hayes in this town called Delaware, Ohio. The home where he was born burned in 1910. At that time, there really wasn't much enthusiasm. It was just really starting to recognize birthplaces. So the home burnt down. There was nothing ever put there. In the empty lot 10 years later, a standard oil gas station was built on the birthplace of Rutherford B. Hayes. Interesting, a couple of years later, it was changed to BP station. So I like to think BP for birthplace. But beyond that, that's pretty much the only tribute. Although in 1926, the Daughters of the American Revolution did build a nice little marker of sorts that's in front of a gas station. Yeah, but that's pretty interesting. You drive up to a birthplace and there's a gas station. <laughs> you fill up. Yeah, I pulled in there one day for, I guess it was one of these travels that I was making with my wife coming from Canada. And all of a sudden, there's just that stone there. And you're freaking out, right? You're pumping your gas. Yeah. And you're like, what the heck? And it, I, I always wonder how many people go there, pump their gas, and have no clue yeah. that they're getting their gas at Rutherford B. Hayes' birthplace. And I think it also speaks to the larger arc of our republic's history. Here you have a citizen servant. Here you have these men who, as Feather S. Foster said when we talked about her book, Mary Lincoln's Flannel Pajamas, she said, except for two of the first ladies, they really just married guys, as she put it. You know, I mean, if you married Ulysses S. Grant, or you married Rutherford B. Hayes, you had no reason to think this guy had the stuff of being a president in him, and you'd someday be living in the White House. They were just people that fell in love, got married, and this is where their lives took them. And the fact that they are only famous sites or only historic sites in the rearview mirror, as you put it, that does speak to that. I think it speaks to something that the founders, as much as they'd see the nation has changed today, they would find that very appealing. They would be glad we don't have men that are being born in castles. They're still being born in just a simple house that might burn down and then they'd put something functional like a gas station there. I think it really says something about the country and about us trying to preserve that republic and the constitution because you might have a house and as much as we love historic sites and maybe I'm trying to make myself and you feel better, but I think the fact that we might have something really small like the super humble Andrew Johnson house, man, that would be a closet. I mean, even in Manhattan, yeah. that would be maybe $600 a month. <laughs> yeah. So tiny, right? That was a kitchen, actually. It wasn't even a house. Oh, yeah, uh, I didn't know that. kitchen as part of Casso's Inn, which was a big inn in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, so his parents worked in the inn, born in a loft in a detached kitchen. Very small little structure. I've seen it. Yeah, I'm, I'm taller than the building. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, I'm 6'3", so <laughs> it's a pretty small building. You can sit on the rock outside, and uh, how would you get in the doors? You'd have to turn sideways. Yeah. It just speaks to how humble the beginnings were of these men, and him humbler than any other. The guy is illiterate and, you know, continues to be. And so does Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson will spell his name. People like to say, presidential historians like Louis Pacone here, five different ways in the same letter, his own name. So, mm -hmm. you know, this was a very simple beginning. There was only one birthplace that you were not able to physically visit for where the presidents were born, that of Franklin Pierce, our 14th president. So tell the listeners why it is off limits and what feelings did you have about not being able to actually walk on that ground? Yeah. So I told you about my first favorite birthplace. Franklin Pierce is probably my second favorite birthplace. It's in Hillsboro, New Hampshire. And he was born in a very small little log cabin, one of the log cabin presidents. 
But very shortly after he was born, his family moved into a much grander home also in Hillsboro, which is now known as the Hillsboro, or I'm sorry, uh, as the Franklin Pierce Homestead. Uh, so if you go to Hillsboro, you're going to probably visit the Franklin Pierce Homestead to learn anything about Franklin Pierce. But he wasn't born in that home, even though some literature does say that was his birthplace, but that's incorrect. Uh, but the log cabin, as log cabins, uh, they're not really built to last. It, it fell apart over the years. Uh, but in 1926, a nearby river was dammed and a man-made lake was created uh, called Jackman Lake. Uh, and it submerged Franklin Pierce's birthplace. Uh, so now in the middle of this man-made lake is the actual birthplace of Franklin Pierce. Uh, so the people at the, uh, at the uh, uh, Pierce homestead would tell me that when the water is really low, you can see some of the foundation of the home. Wow. But I don't know if they were just uh, goofing with me or not because <laughs> I haven't been able to find any pictures yeah. of that. Maybe they hoped that they saw it. Yeah. So urban legend that you yeah. can maybe see some of that. It's like the Pierce Nest Monster. Yeah. Or something. Hey, <laughs> some drunk fishermen out there. I swear I saw yeah. it out there. Yeah. <laughs> I considered how much Franklin Pierce drank and I wanted to say that maybe it makes sense. He was underwater the whole, whole time, a little slosh there. Yeah, he, maybe that's appropriate. He famously said after he left the presidency and really a broken man, he's a very sad story, went into the presidency broken, never mind leaving it, that he said there was nothing left to do but get drunk. So that was his post-presidential plan and he executed it very well. That's what he did, yeah. But a very tragic story. Yeah, he really is. But fascinating too. And that's the thing I think you do learn when you go to the birthplaces, sometimes even the absence of a birthplace like that. Did they change the name to Lake Franklin Pierce? Yeah, or? yeah. So years later, they did change the name to Lake Pierce. So yeah, so at least they gave him that recognition. But there's no sign there that says Franklin Pierce was born here, which is really, it's very interesting and unique because the next president with a birthplace that is completely unacknowledged is actually George W. Bush, who was born in a hospital. It's a functional hospital. They have no interest in putting up any marker or anything. Every other president prior to George W. Bush has something at their birthplace, the actual birthplace, a replica of the birthplace, a roadside marker, but at least there's something there. Yeah, I think with the hospitals, that's going to get progressively harder because hospitals don't always stay there for one thing, but also to, just to put a plaque, which they'll, they'll do eventually, I would assume. I mean, history, you know, it's not really history yet until 50 years later, as they say, and people begin to re-examine you and want to mark it. If it's a little house, I've been to his father's birthplace, man, that's a nice house and there's something about it. But I think we maybe can't see it right now as modern people, but someday people will look at it and say, oh, this hospital, there was a hospital here. Now it's whatever it is, a spaceport or who knows what it'll be in a hundred years, right? looking back. Bill Clinton's hospital is a funeral home now. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, and he actually went to his Uncle Buddy's funeral at his birthplace because the birthplace was torn down and then they built a funeral home on the site. Oh, wow. And that's after he was president? He's gone to the back yep. of the site? Yeah, wow. Yep. In Hope, Arkansas. My guest is Louis Picone, and we're joining you from the Church of the Presidents in Long Branch, New Jersey, a chapel where more presidents worship than any outside the nation's capital. That's seven presidents. And you can learn their story of vacationing and worshiping here at churchofthepresidents.org. And while you're online, check out our guest, Louis Picone, at facebook.com slash presidential birthplaces. You can also visit him at lewispicone.com. This week, our topic is Louis's book, Where the Presidents Were Born. The History and Preservation of the Presidential Birthplaces. The New York Daily News writes of it, quote, Louis Picone spent the last seven years visiting the birthplaces of every U.S. president. Now he has written a book about his passion. And Louis, they say you describe in extensive detail everything anyone might want to know about the presidential birthplaces. Let's dwell on those small details for a moment, because I find sometimes those small things are the ones that tell the big story. For instance, when I visited Theodore Roosevelt's home, Sagamore Hill, not his birthplace, but the house he lived in and died in, I noted that he had a cemetery for the family pets. And these were dogs and cats. There are horses buried places like at the Hayes home, but this was just for family pets, the dogs and cats. And I thought the only other historical home I've been to is not a presidential home, but is Chartwell, Winston Churchill's home in Kent, the United Kingdom. He happens to also have a small pet cemetery there for the cats and dogs that he loved so much and his family loved. Small details like that leap out at you at some of those birthplaces. So I wonder if you would share some of those with us. 
Yeah, when you actually visit the birthplaces, it's one thing researching the birthplaces, and I've done a lot of research, and I've tracked the buildings and tracked the land back and the building of the structures and how they were modified over the years and who else lived in the structures. Like, for instance, I found that at Harry Truman's birthplace, when he became president, the gentleman that owned the home at the time was Wyatt Earp's cousin. So people were coming to visit Truman's birthplace. He also wanted to showcase his famous cousin. So he set up a museum to Truman. People can come in, see the birthplace of Truman, but also buy some postcards, learn uh, about Wyatt Earp. So yeah, there's a lot of detail that I have about these individual structures and then the preservation afterwards. But definitely just by visiting them, you can learn so much that you can't learn from a book. Like Herbert Hoover, after his presidency, he lived in the Waldorf Astoria, extremely rich person, but he was from these very humble roots in West Branch, Iowa. And when he died, he wanted to be buried in West Branch, Iowa. So when you go there and you stand at the birthplace, there's this clearing in the trees that goes all the way up to his grave. So you can see that direct line of his grave up on a hill looking down upon his humble little birthplace. Another little detail is just seeing the environments that these presidents were born in, like Calvin Coolidge, a remote little village, Plymouth Notch in Vermont. It's just this gorgeous area. It's one of the most beautiful birthplaces. But you see this little town. There's only just a handful of buildings there. So you see this small little town where Coolidge was born. He was born in the back of a store. So that's fascinating. Also, I mean, little town births. Jimmy Carter was born in this small little town, Plains, Georgia. And then Ronald Reagan, born on Main Street. Uh, over a store. Yeah, over a store. It's interesting because he lionized Coolidge. He loved Coolidge. Yeah. They're both store-born babies, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Then it turned into a bank that he was born in or uh, above the bank. But it's just so interesting. And reading about these small towns after they became president, where they were preparing for the onslaught of tourists. In Plains, Georgia, they got it. But for some reason, Reagan's birthplace never got those tourists. Also, for Lyndon Johnson's birthplace, too. Again, it's an eye shot of the cemetery that he would later be buried in. So he had family members going back for generations that were buried in that cemetery. Every day when he stepped outside of his birthplace, he can see that cemetery. See where I was going to end up. I think a, a man like Lyndon Johnson who struggled with depression and also had this great sense of destiny or drive, maybe. you know, he, I think he doubted his destiny, but he certainly had a great sense of drive. And so that has to be something that reminds you of what it is. And as Churchill, to mention him again, said, there's so little time left. He said it so much in his life. Meanwhile, he lived to be 90. But I was talking about the Elberon train station that's here near the Church of the Presidents where you can get off and come here. And whenever I stop at that that stop, I always think of James Garfield and then building the little train arm there to take him when he's very sick to the beach and this desperate hope that the sea air will help rejuvenate him from these injuries. And those are things that I think it does make you feel connected. And Johnson had this long family history he felt connected to. So this is the kind of thing you'll learn, I think, when you read Where the Presidents Were Born and your other book also, The President is Dead. This is a connection. I think those ones where you look at a life and you say the person lived that whole life and yet they came back here and w almost walked just a few feet or a mile or something to have their final resting place. That's something. There are two presidents, number seven and number 21, Andrew Jackson and Chester A. Arthur, that have had their birthplaces disputed either at the time. You mentioned Arthur's birthplace being quite close to Canada. They said he was a Canadian. Jackson, not only did they argue over him in, across the Carolinas, north and south, but there was a claim, I believe at one point with him, that he'd been born at sea on his way from Ireland, his parents on his way yeah. from Ireland. So I wondered, how did you handle that sort of gray area in where the presidents were born? Yeah, you know, I found that my, uh, I just decided to embrace it. There are these multiple perspectives for some of the presidents, just these fascinating stories. So I wanted to tell all of the sides of those stories. So Jackson, his father sadly died right before he was born. So he had two sets of aunts and uncles that were very close to the North Carolina, South Carolina border. At the time, they were colonies. The border wasn't really very definitely defined. So one of the cabin was in North Carolina, another one was in South Carolina, or what would become North and South Carolina states. So nobody's quite sure which one he was born in, which cabin he was born in, if it was in North Carolina or South Carolina. So over the years, both North Carolina and South Carolina have claimed them, and it's almost like escalating claims where one puts a sign up, the other state puts a sign up, one puts a marker up, the other one puts a bigger marker up. South Carolina eventually created Andrew Jackson State Park. So I told both sides of that story. 
And then at some point, a map was found, an older map that had Jackson's birthplace in South Carolina. So they pretty much, at this point, they have the mantle of the birthplace, but North Carolina doesn't give up. But yeah, but just telling that whole story, they're following the evidence uh, and where the evidence took me to tell those stories. And I mean, those are the most fascinating places to me. And I mentioned Ohio and Virginia being places where there's so many presidents from the mother of presidents. Now, I'll put you on the spot as a presidential historian and start a little fight with people between Ohio and Virginia with you. But which one lays claim to more presidents and what's the source of their fight? uh, Virginia lays claims to more presidents. There's eight presidents born in Virginia. And in Ohio, there's seven presidents born there. They also like to claim William Henry Harrison as one of their own because he lived there later on in life. But he was born in Virginia. But I like to tell people, if you're interested in the presidential birthplaces, go to Virginia, go to Ohio, and you'll have over one third of the presidential birthplaces just in those two states alone. And you can catch James Buchanan on the way, just swing through there. And- exactly. Go through Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. But in Virginia, you've got Washington, Madison, Jefferson. I like to joke around that in Ohio, you've got more of like the JV team out there, where Rutherford B. Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, Warren G. Harding, some of the lesser known presidents. Lewis has listened to this show before, so he knew not to put McKinley on that list. This interview would end yes. very, <laughs> very acrimoniously. But uh, no, it's funny. Speaking of McKinley, I was at the McKinley Grand Hotel in Canton, Ohio, which is across the street from where he lived with his wife, actually his wife's home. That's now the National First Ladies Museum. And I opened the menu in the room for some room service, and they had written in there that Ohio was ho- was home to the most presidents. And in the margin, some previous guest had written, except for Virginia, exclamation point. <laughs> and I thought, what a great thing that some history lover is there to just deface the menu yeah. because they feel that the history is inaccurate. And that that's the person that I was thinking of there when I asked about it. So. Yeah, like Adam said, facts are stubborn things. <laughs> It's no surprise that I'm big on preserving historic structures like the Church of the Presidents here in Long Branch. Once a site is gone, it's gone forever. Even reconstructions like number 25, William McKinley's birthplace in Niles, Ohio, which is falling into disrepair now, or his successor, number 26, Theodore Roosevelt's brownstone, the one that you can visit, and I go past it many times in Manhattan, is a recreation you know it's it's not the original it does have much of the original furniture it is a very nice building because i believe it was built in the 30s rebuilt reconstructed in the 30s or so so it's a nice building but it's not the same it's not the original and if you love the actual historical facts that sometimes bugs you a little so i wanted you to make your pitch having visited these places to listeners that maybe don't feel the places matter that much. Maybe they are real far on the side of the gas station. They want the gas station there. They're not just making their piece of it, as we just talked about for Rutherford B. Hayes. But why do these places matter? Yeah, for Teddy Roosevelt's birthplace, that was actually rebuilt in the 20s, which is a fascinating story because Roosevelt died in 1919. And for years, in the last couple decades of his life, there was efforts to preserve the site. After he was president, there was efforts to preserve the site. But the area had changed, and for a time it was used as business property. They even asked Roosevelt if he was interested in purchasing the property, but he wasn't. So there was all these efforts to preserve the site. Eventually, the building was torn down so they can build a business there. But what's fascinating, and I think it was torn down maybe 1916, pretty close to when he died. But what's fascinating, almost immediately after Roosevelt died, efforts were made to now to preserve it. Just the fact that he died prompted those preservations efforts. So they rebuilt it in the 20s, almost immediately after he died. But I definitely feel that we need to preserve these historic sites because there's such a sense of place when you're there. There's just nothing like standing in these historic homes. For me, I always think about who else walked in these homes, the important events that happened in these homes. It's kind of like a time machine where you're looking back, you're in FDR's Hyde Park, where so much history happened there that happens to be his birthplace, but also so much other stuff happened there. Uh, He met Churchill there. So you think about all of the different history that happened in that home. That feeling can't be replicated from standing at a roadside marker. So I'm definitely a big proponent of saving these sites. And Even the replicas. The replicas, I mean, they do a lot to recreate that experience, but also the replicas themselves kind of take on a life of their own. I mean, I'm interested in the history of the home that you're actually standing in. 
So I think you just, yeah, you just can't get that when the home is torn down. But one of the things that I found that was so interesting about birthplaces is that, again, because history is being recreated so many years later, it's now 60 years later, 50, 60 years later before anyone takes interest in it. So much has happened during that period. Homes had been torn down. A lot of homes burnt down. A lot of homes were remodeled. Homes were moved. They were relocated from their original foundations. And other people lived in the home. So even right now in John Tyler's home, a family lives in that home. So I always think about people showing up on their doorstep wanting to come visit the birthplace of John Tyler. And they're like, we're uh, in my pajamas. I'm trying to watch TV here. Yeah. Uh, so it's just so fascinating. So maybe especially for birthplaces, those replicas really take on so much more importance. And then again, just the story of these replicas kind of takes on a life of their own. That makes me think of Martin Van Buren's birthplace, which he was born over a pub. Very early republic, very ideal of a democratic republic where we vote for our own leaders. It's just a kind of a 60s split level there now. And so and he's also born right across, or buried rather, right across the street, very close, I believe. So, yeah, pretty close, yeah. So people will go knock on the door and say, can, is, can we see his birthplace? And you say, now Martin Van Buren, you know, he's the first president born as an American citizen. So after the revolution, does this look like a house that was <laughs> built in you know, the 1770s? Like it doesn't look like it was ever a bar, you know, a yeah. pub where people lived and came and passing through. So yeah, that was- Final siding on it. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. that's a. It just doesn't compute. But it does have a plaque. So sometimes people may just stop and decide to knock on the door and ask to see Van Buren's room. It would be kind of funny if they set it up and said, "Though this TV, this is his flat screen." <laughs> to see how far people would need to yeah. be pushed to realize <laughs> it's not actually his place. So that's kind of cool. So one thing fascinating about the Van Buren birthplace is years ago there is a lake area in New Jersey called Lake Mohawk, which was a man-made lake. And the builder had a flair for the historic, and he decided to build some of his homes based off of historic homes. So there's currently a home in Lake Mohawk that was based off of Martin Van Buren's birthplace. It seems like such an unusual home to then make private homes in that model. His house is also very nice. The house that he lived in, that he designed and put together, that's yeah, also Lindenwald. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a fantastic one. It's one of my favorites. I went there when they were doing renovation and restoration, speaking of that. And they took down the wall and they noticed they had the wallpaper there. And they were able to contact the company in France that still had the presses to remake the wallpaper and put on the wall from, I mean, think about that, 150 years before. And they were able to recreate the same wallpaper from the same company that was still still there through the world wars and the great depression and all the intervening time, our own civil war and fires and all the upheavals, the revolutions France had had. And they just called the paper company and I don't know how you even called them. They wouldn't have had a phone for Martin Van Buren, but yeah. that's just such one of those great restoration things where you don't have that opportunity to go and stand there and look at the paper and say, all right, this was Martin Van Buren's taste or, you know, something like the Eisenhower birthplace or his home that you can go to. And I said, I want to go upstairs and see where he had his brother sleep across the his bedroom door because the doctors have said, had said, we have to amputate your leg. He was very sick. He had an injury, I believe, playing football. And Eisenhower said, well, I, I want to play football. I'd rather be dead than play football, basically. And he said, sleep there because don't let the doctor come in and, and take my leg. <laughs> and you think of how history would be different if his brother didn't. And I said, I, I want to see that spot. you know. And you, It's not the same even in a recreated home. You want to see what it would feel like to sleep there as a 14-year-old boy with your brother there, not knowing – I mean, it's going to be your fault, too, if he gets gangrene and died. It's like <laughs> that, that's the spot where that happened, where that kid not knowing he was saving a brother that would go on to win the war and play this massive role and be a two-term president. So yeah, I love those places. Lewis, we could talk all day about presidents. We probably will after we wrap up. I want to finish by exploring the chapel a little bit more here. We'll do that off the air and we'll look forward to that interview later. First, though, I want to give you a chance here to thank the people who helped you in your travels. You mentioned your father and that research of this kind is never a solitary effort, at least if you're very fortunate to have a family like yourself or a wife like mine who's interested in these, and we can share the thing that we love with those we love. So I noticed names like Ralph Picone and Joseph F. Picone under the pictures of where the presidents were born as photo credits. So how did your family help you? And if they're in the acknowledgement, you thank uh, Mi Familia, I believe. So how did they help you bring this book to print? Yeah. So one of the things that I learned in writing a book is that 
it takes a village to write a book. It takes many people. So for my travels, so first my wife, Francesca, and my sons, Leonardo and Vincent, they traveled with me on many of these sites. Almost always, they were happy to come on the sites. Occasionally, they had to raise their hands. Enough was enough. <laughs> but I like to say my boys, so now they're 9 and 13. They've probably been to more presidential sites and been through more presidential tours than people will in a lifetime. So they were great traveling partners. I mentioned my parents, Ralph and Marie, that came with me on these trips. We'd load up the minivan and they'd go anywhere. My dad shared the enthusiasm with me. My mother, occasionally, like when we got to Hayes' birthplace at the gas station, she just said, I'll wait in the car. That's all right. You guys go out there, take your pictures, and I'll wait in the car. But for the photo credits, like I said, like my family, they like to travel to these spots too. So my brother Joseph had been to many of these spots, so he had given me some pictures. And my brother Ralph, too, had also been to these sites. Even my sister Rosemary helped me edit the book. She helped me edit initial copies of the book that had been sent to the publisher. So I like to joke around that the only person that knows more about presidential birthplaces is my sister Rosemary because she read the book over and over. And my nieces, Danielle, Maggie, Katrina, Mary, and Olivia, they were also great sports. They'd come on the trip with me too. One time we were lost looking for Zachary Taylor's birthplace. And it was after a long day of traveling. We'd been to Jefferson's birthplace earlier that morning. We'd been to Monticello. So we just kept driving up and down this road for like an hour looking for the birthplace. You can tell they were hungry, they were tired, but they just wouldn't give up with me. They were good sports. So yeah, so uh, definitely I thank my family for this. Well, Louis Picone, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you to your family for helping you produce this great book that we could sit here in the Church of the Seven Presidents and discuss. It's again called Where the Presidents Were Born. I'll look forward to meeting up with you to talk about your next book, The President is Dead, The Extraordinary Stories of the Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. And that will include James Garfield, who passed away right across from the Church of the Seven Presidents here after the assassination. Best of luck with both titles, and I'll look forward to running into you in a presidential birthplace someday. Thank you, Dean. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Again, the book is Where the Presidents Were Born, The History and Preservation of the Presidential Birthplaces. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even bookmark the URL off our homepage for all your online purchases. You go to historyauthor.com, we take you to Amazon, and Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make, and it doesn't show up in your shopping cart, so it doesn't cost you anything extra. Once again, my sincere thanks to fellow presidential history nerd, Louis Picone, not just for his time, but for agreeing to come meet me at the Church of the Presidents. Thanks to them for hosting us, and please visit their site, home of the Long Branch Historical Museum Association. It's churchofthepresidents.org. And while you're there, you can check out that cocktail reception that they're going to have in August. And you can follow Louis Bacone at facebook.com slash presidential birthplaces. And remember to look out for our follow-up interview on Louis's second book. It's called The President is Dead, The Extraordinary Stories of the Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. I see a lot of history accounts on social media, as you can imagine, and posts by Lewis always draw my interest beyond the common cereal box trivia. He really digs deep and puts up some great pictures and stories. Plus, he's out there, standing in front of the birthplaces. He really walks the walk. This is not a book that he researched out on Wikipedia or just Googling around. It's really great to see his passion. And that's coming from somebody who's done a lot of presidential tourism myself. And while you're online, remember to let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for this presidential installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And don't forget to look out for our follow-up interview with Lewis about his book, The President is Dead, The Extraordinary Stories of the Presidential Deaths, Final Days, Burials, and Beyond. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, 
and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes. 